Welcome everybody to another one of our AIM Sports Learn Fast webinars. This is the 127th one that we've done. This is the fourth one of 2022. And uh, just been having a great time with these, learning so much and, um, and finding other ways of helping people learn. And, and I think that's what we found here today. We have a, we have a, a guest with us today, Nolan Lampkin, a uh, young man from the Indianapolis, Indiana area. And Nolan is a uh, is a motorcycle racer, enthusiastic, smart, bright kid who is uh, one of the things he's doing. We're going to talk about a lot about his motorcycle racing, but uh, one of the one of the things that uh, brought him into my, you know, got him onto my radar, you know, a couple of years ago is uh, he began to share all of his data, and uh, uh, and he's racing in a series that it's uh, you know a, a very competitive series and a very competitive class. And uh, so uh, giving the data away is not a uh, inconsequential thing. He's, uh, he's helping a lot of people and, uh, and we'll talk a lot about that. But uh, thank you, Nolan, for joining us. I sure appreciate you having you, uh, having you here joining us. Thank you, Roger. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We'll have a good time. The, um, the, this is, uh, uh, if anybody has any questions in the, uh, for those of us that are watching here live, uh, go ahead and plug them into the question and answer, and uh, we'll, 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 Nolan and I will do our best to answer those. If you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, the recording later, uh, all of the, the the links that we may discuss and and uh, in any number of things will be down in the description box. If you just click on the show more button, you will be able to open up that dialog that box and uh, and have all the stuff that we may mention here today. So keep that in mind. I appreciate it. The um, uh, Oops, darn it. Oops, I think I was at the wrong end of the presentation. There we go. The um, uh, Nolan is um, is a young young writer, as I mentioned. He began writing it uh, at a young age. When we chatted on the phone uh, yesterday a little bit, uh, maybe on email first, I don't recall, but he mentions that he started writing at uh, two and a half years old, and that's... Uh, uh, I, I think I wasn't walking at two and a half. So yeah, that's, uh, that, that's saying something obviously. Right. And, um, maybe about me, the racing at, uh, racing began his racing career at nine years old and, and, and his first professional race at 14. That's pretty impressive. And, um, uh, and he's, and he's running in the Moto America, uh, series in the, in the super sport, uh, is it 600 class Nolan? Yeah, last year I ran in Moto America Super Sport 600. Super 600. And uh, uh, had a podium finish and a, and a number of top fives. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, this is a, uh, uh, a competitive uh, series and a traveling series that, uh, that he's running uh, at tracks all, all, over, the, uh, all over North America and, and uh, doing a great job. 20 years old, uh, based in Indianapolis, and this is the first time he's joining us. So I, again, I, uh, I thank you for coming, Nolan. Tell us... Um, Tell us a little bit about your uh, a little bit about your background. What um, family ties into bike racing? Just motorsports in general. How how did you uh, how did you get to where you got started at two and a half and uh, racing at nine? So, I got my first bike at two and a half years old. Santa Claus brought it to me, uh, JR fifty. Um, my family's always been into racing, both sides. My dad um, likes cars. He liked drag racing. That's what he was really interested in. Um, and then on my mom's side of the family. My great grandfather used to own a Norton dealership and a Ducati dealership back in the day. Um, and he had a mattress store and he'd have the Nortons and the Ducatis in the front of the store, take the pictures, send it off to the dealership, pull the bikes up, put the mattresses back in. Uh, and <laughs> you then, do what you do what you gotta do, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and then my grandfather on my mother's side, just like motorcycles as well. It's kind of just been in the blood yeah. and been raised in it. And then I started riding at two and a half. And then I started racing on a go-kart track in Ohio on a KX65 mini moto at nine years old. And uh, the, the, my family has a, a very similar story. My, uh, my father uh, enjoyed motorsports quite a bit and did a lot of the drag racing side. And that's what got us into the motorsports, even though it wasn't drag racing. So uh, oh, it's kind of flipped around, not flipped around, but uh, gone full circle in my, my world is, is my dad now has a drag race, drag race car that he does in retirement with my, uh, with my older brother. So the, um, uh, you've settled on road racing. Is, uh, is that all you have done or did you try any other forms of uh, motorcycle racing? For me, it's really been road racing. My dad asked me when I was eight or nine, do you want to start racing? Um, and he was thinking I was going to go drag racing, but <laughs> I started out road racing and that's really what I like to do. That's what I enjoy. Um, I've done other stuff here and there, but it's not been road racing is what I like. That's what I have a passion for. And that's what I continue to do. 
it's interesting, different forms of racing. And uh, uh, I've never done a ton of drag racing. I've made a few runs, but uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, that all out acceleration, but you only, you know, you only get to, you know, 10 or 12 seconds of it. Right. And, uh, and, and, uh, and on the bike, you're, you're coming off of every corner and you can't actually think of it as a, uh, is a series of drag racing. Right. So right. you, you, uh, you, 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 you can look at it that way as well. The, um, uh, as far as the bikes and all that, your dad, did he, did he actually ride, uh, race bikes at, at all? And, uh, or, or did he do street stuff or what, what was his background? For him, the big thing was just building the bikes. I think he okay. raced a couple of times um, at local stuff here in Indiana. Um, he might have gone to Muncie Drag Strip or something like that, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, his thing was always just building bikes, and that's what we kind of got started with. And then, like you said, now it's grown into road racing, and our races are 30 minutes long, not 15 seconds, and it's <laughs> much different. And maybe even a couple times a, a day too, right? You know, it's yeah, not exactly. like you're, uh, you're 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 only one time during the day. The um, and I happen to agree with your dad in that way. I I and I think you do too. I've read your I've been on your website. You have inherited that that uh, that gene at some level of liking to build things. Uh, that side of it as well. The writing is fun, but the building is uh, building is uh, is enjoyable as well. And tweaking and making sure it's going to work right. You mentioned to me that. Um, you built, uh, you, you were going to race and you built the very first bikes that you were going to race. You had a big part of putting that together. Is that, uh, is that a side that you really enjoy as well? So uh, I think as most builders can attest to, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so great. Uh, last year for 2021, I built my Yamaha R6. I got most of the stuff together. Obviously I had good people put the finishing touches on it. I can't take all the credit, but I took the bike from as a street bike, took it off disassembled it did that stuff my dad helped here and there and then i ground the subframe did some different stuff um and that so i've got a bit of a unique perspective compared to some people just where i've done that before i've built the bike um and just seen the ins and out ins and outs and some specific things obviously there's a lot of stuff complicated in the motorcycle so i've seen my share do you think uh, the, do you think the knowledge of or the the experience and then the knowledge of being able to engineer or build the bike has has helped you be a better rider? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. And certainly there's been some times in the past in which I felt something on the bike and I could diagnose while I'm on the track. Oh, well, I think even if it's something simple like, oh, this handlebar seems a little bit loose, I can come in and just immediately know what the issue is generally, or it's at least being able to give feedback based on this or that or whatever. And then understanding it to know, like at VIR this year in Virginia, we were having a weird feeling on the front end of the bike. And I didn't know it, but once they described it, then it made sense and I knew what it was. So if I had that feeling again, I can go back and say, oh, well, it's, it's this or that or whatever, because I, I know some of that different stuff. I think, I think it's such a valuable tool as a, as a writer, to, <clears throat> pardon me, as a writer to understand you understand the bike at a deeper level than just the the, the pegs and the handlebars, right? I, I, to me, it seems like it uh, it can't help but help uh, a rider be better, and certainly over the long term, you know that uh, if you understand you know, riding it hard or beating up on it, or uh, you know wearing down, you know running out the tires or you know whatever it happens to be, if you understand mechanically how it works, I think it can't can't hurt you, and it's pretty impressive. I I, I, I will I will go so far as to say I get to a lot of races and a lot of different forms of racing and. Um, and I see less and less of the of the professional rider or the the young amateur that is uh, that does their own uh, d- does some of their own work and understands things. There's the you know there's there's typically not typically but there's often a uh, you know uh, uh, you're the rider you know, you know, go have something to drink you know get yourself ready to do what you do right and uh, and and you've taken a different uh, you know, attack at that so that, that's uh, I enjoy that. We're going to talk about the data. And, uh, and sharing of your data, which is such a huge thing that in, in just a moment, but wanted to talk a little bit more about the website and some of the stuff that you provide. The, the, you have a Nolan Lambkin Racing, and there's, uh, there's some areas in there that where you have done uh, document, you document things, whether it be documents or, or a lot of video, where you go in and you, uh, there's something that you have created some knowledge on from your from your own work and uh and and you've created a video on it and and they're fairly you know the uh, i think you call them uh, tech tech tips i think and you've gone in and just built some videos on how to do this and let's talk about brakes and let's talk about tires and let's talk about the one i uh, the one i watched uh, late last night was 
a, a shop organization as much as yeah. down to a to a whiteboard, right? And 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 how do we work on things in the shop and make sure things get done correctly? Uh, that is a that is a, a a pretty cool thing that you're building there. What what are your thoughts about that? And where what have you done in the past? How many of them you've done a little bit? And then are you are you considering doing those more in the future? Yeah, so it's the biggest thing for me is there's so much knowledge out there in the world, but sometimes it just kind of stays locked away just where you got to know the right person to learn the thing at the right time. And if you don't have that, then it's difficult to know. A lot of the stuff that I've learned has been from other people sharing this or that or whatever. And I just try and put that out there. I've done different stuff in the past. Like you said, the video um, about whiteboards and just organizing that stuff. Because at the end of the day, I like racing bikes. That's what I like doing. Working on bikes is... Um, kind of what I have to do to get it done. Um, and that's great. So whatever I can do personally to minimize that time is what I try and do just so I can go and ride more, whatever the case might be. I have different stuff that I'm working on for this year, trying to include more of those tech tip style videos and some of that stuff from the Moto America races where I can talk and we'd be at the track talking about this product or why I do this or why we do that, why the team chooses something, all of that stuff, just so it's more information for people to decide it's not do this or do that um and more stuff involved basically just so it's more information for people so far i've noticed that a lot of it has been you know the technical tips right you've got it named correctly obviously but it's but it's talking about parts of the bike or how you do certain things are you going to do somewhere you talk about you know how to ride the, the riding part better you know that piece of this are you going to venture down to that road or, or have you already um, I want to. Um, I haven't really done as much in the past. It's really just finding the right format and the right way to organize it where everybody has different things. You can ride the bike so differently. Um, I can ride it one way and somebody else can ride it completely different, but we still end up doing the same time. Um, and there's certain specific things. For me, it's been a lot of setup with the bike, getting it to the right point. My crew chief last year was Freddie Carswell from Superbike Unlimited and getting him there to really help understand the bike and get it built to me, for me in the right way. It's, that's been one of the biggest things. And that's what I try and share with other people, just where it's some of that other information or reaching out to different people. Um, writing's interesting and I certainly want to do more, but it's really trying to figure out the right way to do that for me personally. Perfect. Uh, you, um, it's an interesting uh, balance of being being a racer and then uh, and then your your makeup of being somebody that likes to teach and likes to to share information i i'm uh, i commend you for that i think that there's there there is a, a decent number of people in motorsports that do that but uh, sometimes it's such a hard sport where you're you're having to dedicate so much time to do you know, to, to do the motorsports thing that they don't take as much time as you have to, uh, to, to help teach people provide information. And, uh, and, and that's a good thing. How is your, how is your, um, how's your team made up right now? I know you talked about you, you and your dad and, you know, a fairly small team. I've seen a little bit of that. Where's your career at right now? Are you still racing on uh, just the two of you or, or where are you, where are you going? So in the past year I had my dad and I obviously, um, and then I had Freddie Carr as well as my crew chief um, from Superbike Unlimited. Then I had a friend of mine, Jeffrey Obrey, um, and he was a mechanic as well. And I had a few different things. For me, it's really just trying to get the right package sorted, get that put together and then build from there. So last year I was on a Super Sport 600 on a Yamaha R6. Um, this next year we're trying to get that stuff figured out. And I've been working on stuff for the past few months and it should be coming to head here soon, but um, that's what I've got so far. Do you do in your world of of um, the, the the form of racing that you do or the, or where you do it, it, it? You typically only run one bike on a weekend, or is it? Uh, do, there are some riders that runs uh, multiple classes. Really, you only ride one bike per weekend. Sometimes some people would do different things, but it's a lot of work uh, yeah. for the crew itself. Where finding all of that stuff, different people do different things. Yeah. Back. Uh, years ago in the AMA, which is now Moto America, which is a series that I race in, they didn't have two races per weekend. They had one race of people would ride a 600 and then a 750 or different things like that. The series has changed now. So it's two races per weekend. So you're getting basically that same time, but you're only riding 
one bike. Yeah, if you did more than more than one bike, you'd be it'd be an overwhelming amount of track time and, uh, and no no breaks, and the the crew would be getting crushed, right? <laughs> so perfect, perfect. Let's talk. Let, let's start going down the data road a little bit more. Uh, you, you talked about your crew chief Freddie that uh, that has been been working on this, and, I, and as I chatted with you, you understand data and you do data, but Freddie is you know, does a good chunk of that for you, right? And uh, and then you maybe look at it as uh, as you go through it as well. What um, let me? I think I've got a let me. Uh, there there are some links. Uh, I'm going to bring up a data slide here in just a second, and then maybe we'll run into some live data if we wish. But uh, here's some links as we get into the data side of this. There's a link to Nolan's uh, uh, racing page. Uh, we'll probably have those in the chat box as well. Certainly uh, for those of you that are watching this later on YouTube, uh, all of these links will be down uh, included into the to the description box below. A uh, little bit about, uh, there's a page there that uh, talks a little bit about Nolan and what he's done. The, but the one, uh, and I'm not sure which of these ones, I, they may go to the same place, but they're, the biggest one, one of the biggest things that you're doing is, is sharing your data. And I noticed, um, uh, I think the 2020 data and the 2021 data. And what, um, how, how are you picking which data files to send and uh, to, to store and, and make available? And, uh, um, and, and what has the re replies been so far? What, what kind of feedback have you gotten from this? Um, what I choose is I try and choose races that are actually important. Um, I wanna give away when I got on the podium, when I got top fives, when I had good things, not just picking something like a free practice session and giving that away just because it's not useful to people. I'm trying to do for me what I wish I would have had years ago. Um, and that's basically what my view is for so many different things is it's teaching myself things. Because if I do it and I like it, then somebody else out there will as well. So what I've done in the past is choosing all of that stuff, giving that stuff away. Um, there was one question that you had at the end, but I kind of forgot what it was, to be honest. But the, uh, what, what kind of feedback have you got from folks? Have you, have, yeah. has, have you gotten some chat at some people at the track or, or Facebook posts or, 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 or DMs or anything? What, uh, what kind of feedback are the people giving you? It's really been quite crazy, just seeing all the different stuff. It's really spread quite far. Um, like over 300 people have downloaded this year's data files, which I think is amazing. Um, and then I've had different, seen different posts online with different people comparing and seeing different things. But there's a lot of stuff just talking about bike setup or it's, oh, it's my bike or it's this or it's that. But if I'm on a 600 and I'm carrying more speed than what somebody else might be through this one section, they realize, oh, well then I can do that or I need to get my bike better to get that. And it's that stuff there as well. It's seeing something other than your own perspective, just because then it gives you something else to see. There's been posts on different forums online. Uh, people message me all the time and it's really cool. People, I, there's one guy that I remember and I think he was in Spain and he emailed me. He's like, you're a different breed. Nobody else does this. Like, <laughs> That's great. I think that was a positive thing, right? No. <laughs> That, that's funny. The um, uh, I also, as uh, I had a son that uh, was in motorsports when data was pretty was was coming up big that way, and and uh, we shared the data, and we were in a competitive class. Uh, I didn't put it out in. Um, you know, on a website like you do, but uh, if anybody asks, and a lot of people got to know that uh, our Spec Miata data or our our uh, MX-5 Cup data was available, if anybody would just ask for it, you know, we would uh, we would give it freely, and that um, uh, there is a lot of things people can get from data, but it's but it's not. Um, it's not like you've given them the entire setup to the world, right? There's a it it. it, there, it it is a whole big, it's one piece of a whole bigger pie, right? And the, um, and, and the small setups and of course the driver techniques and all, and, and all of these things are all part of it. But I think you've, you struck on it exactly right though. It's the, um, that, that person that has kind of hit the wall, uh, you know, the, the roof of where they're, they're not able to find any more speed. And if they could just look at some data and understand where on the track, even where this was, was it braking? Was it acceleration? Is my bike okay? Is it, or is it, you know, uh, corner speeds or you know, whatever it happens to be, it gives them a much better idea of where to go. And it's such a huge value the, uh, uh, to, to many users. I'm glad that, um, you know, folks are using it. Um, it. The other thing that I'd like to say about it was, uh, this is not just normal. This is not just a, uh, a chunk of data with some GPS channels. The data that you've that you've providing, and we're going to open up and 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 show a slide here right now. The um, 
this is data file. That's one of the ones that were uh, that I, I downloaded the files and and it, and just picked one at random, and it happened to be uh, WeatherTech Laguna Seca data. And um, if you look over here on the left, the the it's it's got an ECU, so there's the, all the ECU style of channels, but it's also got brake pressure. It's got suspension sensors. This is a you know, fully loaded data file, right? So it's a, a lot of, lot of good information for everybody. What uh, uh, have you always had the suspension data on there and some of these other things, or is this uh, have you slowly built up the the data on your on your bike to something that works for uh, you and Freddie? For different. With different bikes, we've changed stuff and gotten progressively better. I was on a 2015 Yamaha R6, and then now I'm on a 2020 Yamaha R6. That has different ECU channels, um, and you see different things through that. Um, this is basically what we run, and we've run it for the past number of years. Back when I was on a KTM 390 in the Junior Cup, or back then it was called the KTM Cup with Moto America, you were only allowed to have a lap timer. You couldn't really have anything else, okay. so that's what we started with, and then kind of built up from there. Um, and the thing that I find really interesting is just like I talked before about with writing, how there's different ways to do things. One of the big things being able to see it on the data was last year when the first race that we had back from the pandemic was Road America in uh, May. And I went out in the first session and it just felt so weird and I couldn't really place what it was, but I was going into the corners way too quick and just smashing <laughs> the brakes and going too deep. And as it progressed, my move my braking marker earlier. So I was braking a hundred feet earlier and being able to progressively get on the brakes and get on them in the correct way to get the front the way that I want it. And that's stuff to get it into the corner. Everybody thinks, oh, we are going faster. So that means you're just braking later and braking harder. But when I was actually doing that, that made it worse. And I think I did get a message one time from a guy saying, you're actually braking just a little bit earlier than me, but you're going a number of seconds quicker oh, than me. Yeah, the track. So that stuff I think is interesting and truly insightful. It, it, absolutely. It's such a, uh, you think it's motorsports, right? So in, whether it's in bikes or off-road trucks or, or some sports car that you just hammer it harder, right? And uh, and it will work. It, but there's that fine line, it, it, it's the hump, right? And boy, if you go over that, uh, that knife's edge at, at the top, speed starts to drop off immediately. And while you, and then you, uh, we all can at some point say, well, I, I'm a second behind now. I, I better ride even harder yet. And then you get yourself in that little loop of, uh, boy, everything I do, it just, it, it seems to be getting worse. And uh, I'm glad that somebody went out of their way to, to even mention it to you. That's, that, that was kind of nice. Um, you work with, you mentioned you worked with your crew chief, Freddie, what kind of channels when you're, when you look at the data, what, um, What's important to you? What do you, what what do you uh, what do you sit down? Uh, I understand you've told me in the past that the you know you spend a lot of time at the at the measures graph that we're looking at here. What uh, what what are the channels that you kind of focus on? The channels that I tend to focus on is basically brake pressure, throttle position, um, and there's two different throttle positions on the Yamaha R6. There's what your hand is doing, and then what the throttle blades themselves are actually doing. So I'll look at both of those and see that stuff. Um, Freddie goes through and he does his own thing. Um, and I look mm -hmm. at GPS speed and RPM. I try and keep it fairly simple and things that are actually manageable and useful for me. Um, if I feel something on track or it's, I'm wanting to look at something that night, I can pull it up and look at that and see, oh, well, I was doing this in that corner, or whatever. Uh, this is what the ride height was or whatever the case might be. Um, and that's, I just try and keep it manageable. There's so many different things that you can do with the data, but being able to have six channels that I regularly use and just keep it at that. And then I know what I'm doing and it's not getting lost in the thousand different channels that we could look at. It's being practical with the situation. We talk here quite a bit about uh, uh, a data analysis you know, concept or the, the data analysis, the, the important pieces, right? Because it can be, I mean, you've got, if we look at this screen here, I mean, look at the slider bar over here on the side and we're looking at, uh, yeah, they're doubled up because I've got two laps open in this image, but, but uh, we're only looking at the top, uh, you know, 15% of the data channels, right? So the, uh, there, you have a lot of data, but in order to be not overwhelmed by this and we, and we need to continue to work hard at this and not, um, not, not 
get overwhelmed by it, I always talk about the money channels and it's the ones I always look at first. It's, it's the lap times and the speed and, uh, and, and lap times being the, the most important. Yes. Yeah, speed builds lap times, but lap time is what you're really after. Right. And then, and then all of those other channels that they're important because they, they are affecting those two. And so if, if your speed is up or down, uh, something is going uh, weird. Then you start to open those other channels, and you and they're all there as backup information, uh, as information about the speed, right? Metadata, as, as they they tend to call it. Um, you know, was I slow coming off the corner? Did I get to the throttle early on? Was I in the right gear? Did I get off the brakes correctly? Did I take the right line? All of those things. So data can be uh, data can be overwhelming, but it doesn't need to be, right? And right. I think that's what I heard you say. So uh, pretty interesting. I yeah, you, you talked about. Um, Freddie Carswell and I see that he is here joining us. So hopefully we're uh, we don't uh, don't say no. He's a uh, he'll he'll be fine with all the stuff we're talking about. I'm sure. Thanks for coming here, Freddie. I appreciate it. The um you you get some information here and the uh, one of the things that I I enjoyed you, you mentioned a minute ago was uh, you, you fast in slow out right and and uh, we'll we'll go to some live data here in a little bit and even on your own we're looking at your data here a lap two laps. Uh, of of, uh, of data one one earlier in the session or one maybe a little bit later in this case it's uh, uh, lap seven versus thirteen and we're looking at this and this time compare bar down here is giving us an idea of of where to look into the data right as a, a quick view just when when these when these lines go up or down you know the blue lap if it's if it's trending down it's faster if it's trending up it's slower and right. we and so we what we like to do is go in here and, and just really quickly scan this and and maybe this is an area in some live data we'll go look at or we'll try to understand why you were had gained a bunch of time but lost a bunch my guess is exactly what you just mentioned is on this particular lap on that blue lap you tried to go in a little faster and and you had a, a an exit speed problem that uh, that actually hurt you a little bit more on the way out but um that that's the way that um, you mentioned to me yesterday that you uh, that you look at it as well is that is that a good idea of how you kind of uh, review your data yeah the big thing is like you said exactly whenever the line trends up or whenever it trends down um and there's different things where because I'm on the bike, if Freddie's seeing something or whatever may be the case, I can go through and say, oh, well, at the exit of turn two at Laguna Seca, the bike was pumping a lot. So that was really affecting the way that I was getting on the gas. Or maybe I just ran into a guy. There was yeah. some traffic in that situation or something like that. It's finding those things. And yeah, Freddie just mentioned into the chat box there that traffic during this event, I mean, they're big events, right? These are, you you race in competitive big events and there's a lot of bikes and and obviously traffic can be uh, can be an issue as well. So, but the data, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I wasn't there, didn't uh, didn't look at this data ahead of time, never chatted with you or Freddie about it, but the consistency was was very good. We'll look at that a little bit uh, uh, in a minute when we jump to the live data. I wanted to go through a couple other slides of just what maybe some different ways to look at the data, maybe get your feedback. You and I chatted ahead of time that uh, the 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 matrix graph is where you spend a lot of time. I agree that that's where uh, where I, I I'm used to reading the squiggly lines right and uh, and bringing stuff up and and understanding the relationship. But other people uh, yeah, have other ways of looking at it as well, right? So the um, let's look at a couple of other ways that uh, this particular data file. And again, these are these are available to you. We put the link into the chat box, and the link will be available in the description box below to this data plus two years of other data at, uh, at many different tracks around the United States uh, that Nolan has, uh, is freely giving away to anybody that wants to download it. Um, here is, a, here is a, what we call the channels report. And, uh, and I just picked some channels uh, that might give, uh, might give some information that, uh, uh, about it. Here's the lap times that, uh, that Nolan turned in this data, it gives you an idea of how consistent the data was and how good of a data file this will be for, if, for you to, to, to take a look at if you're, if you're trying to learn some things. You know, he started off with uh, you know, probably some traffics in the, you know, in the low 28s. Boom! A couple of twenty sevens, a twenty seven one on the on on what was the probably the, the fourth or fifth lap. The uh, uh, the bold in our report means it was the fastest lap of the session, and then then just sat there and just clicked off just uh, twenty eight after twenty eight after twenty eight. Just uh, you know what is that ten or twelve laps, and then uh, 
and then uh, one right there at the end. It was traffic induced, or you, you couldn't get the position, so you're 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 finishing up, uh, you know, safely or whatever. But a little bit slow right there at the end. Not a not a big deal. The other thing that I like to see is you know channel reports. It gives us the minimum speeds, the maximum speeds. You know, your maximum brake pressure. Uh, something I want to ask you about on that. The uh, RPMs. What I we it highlights the the highest value. If it was uh, in the laps that we're looking at, uh, you, you, you know, 16.4 uh, as an RPM to those of us that are car racers or, or off-road guys, or you know, uh, the, 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 that's a pretty big number, right? <laughs> but uh, it gives you an idea of what the what the, what the maximum was. Your water temperature. Uh, one of the ones that I like to do is in this kind of a report is a is a is an average throttle position. Just how much you know, where were you at on the throttle on average? And and uh, it's kind of interesting that for for uh, what you're doing, it it started at 53 with good fresh tires, and and it sat there, dropped down a little bit. There's a couple more 53s, and and uh, it's sat pretty close. And alternators working, everything is good. One question I I thought I would ask is brake pressure. I noticed that there is just a channel of brake pressure. Um, probably no doubt that it's the front brake pressure. Do you uh, do you use the rear brake at all in in your form of motorsports, uh, road racing a bike? No, I don't really use the rear brake that much. On the R6, I use front brake pressure and that's really it. We try and use the right engine management to control the wheelie and the oh, engine okay. braking. Sometimes what I've seen in the past and what I've heard is people who use the rear brake too much. Some people, they might be masking other problems with the bike where they're trying to control the wheelie or they're trying to do this or that or whatever. I'm only on a Yamaha R6, which is 600. So it's not an absolute monster trying to wheelie all over the place, but it's really just trying to get the other side of the electronics working properly. Um, in that article about my data that I gave away this past year, I actually talk about wheelie control and throttle control and some of that stuff um, and just how it works on the new bike. There's certain things that I didn't know about, like you have to hold the throttle at 100% for the wheelie control to work the whole time. Um, if you roll out of it, then it kicks off and it doesn't, it doesn't actually work right. And I didn't understand that quite the first uh, sessions that I use the bike and use the new throttle um, wheelie control. But once I got it, then it made sense. And that's, again, just more sharing of that information. I've gotten messages from people about that saying that they didn't realize that's what it was either. So sometimes it's just figuring out what works for you. And for me, I just prefer using the front brake, but on different bikes, people do different things. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the, the modern electronics, right. It used to be, well, you know, I'm an old guy, right. So, but it used to be that you, the, the rider would use the rear brake a little bit more and, uh, to kind of roll onto it if it was starting to lift up instead of having to totally get off the throttle. I've talked to some friends of mine that are, uh, that are motorcycle racers and it's, it, they've either sometimes maybe they've crashed or, or, or something has happened in that rear break becomes uh, unusable and, uh, in an event and the, 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 the at first I was going, what in the world? And they said, uh, absolutely no concern, right? It, I don't use it anyway. You know, it's like, oh, really? And to me, it's a, you know, it was a little bit of a foreign thought at first. So kind of interesting. There was a brake pressure channel in the data. If anybody downloads this, it's uh, it's clearly front and there isn't even a rear. So it's because he's, because you, because you're never using it. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. The, um, the other one that I enjoy here in this one here, and it shows your consistency, again, just a way of looking at the data is the distance traveled per per lap. And, uh, you know, you got that one uh, 11,300 uh, area, but for the most part, they're, uh, they're in the 400s. Um, kind of interesting that your, your fastest lap was also your shortest travel distance. You know, maybe there's a, there's a piece of data in there for you to, uh, to, to chew on and say, okay, well, maybe, what, what did I, where did I go? What did I do that I, you know, where, where did I cut that, uh, cut that footage out? And was it really faster in that segment? Might be a, might be a fun thing to kind of look into. The other one, another one that uh, you and I did not chat about, but uh, uh, looking at this exact same data file, uh, looking at the, 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 one of the best laps is a, is a histogram. And uh, in this particular case, I thought I would uh, bring it up and just show it here and how much time spent full throttle. And it, this is just a, a percentage of time of, of a channel. In this case, I picked uh, the throttle position, but the, but the, what you as a as a writer are doing, not necessarily what, the, as you mentioned, there's two different throttle positions. I, I wanted to know what your hand was doing, and I wanted to to bring it up and put it into ten different bins. So zero to ten percent of the time, basically off throttle, thirty nine point six percent of the time, and uh, thirty eight percent at full throttle, ninety to one hundred percent, and then and here's the area in between. Uh, th that that is a, a 
um, an interesting histogram. You know, usually we see maybe a little bit more, but uh, as you mentioned, it's a 600. Maybe it's not. Uh, it's not the monster that you. As your words, it's not the monster that uh, that it can be. And you've got the electronics nowadays, so you can you can just twist twist that thing wide open. Is that is that how you would read this as well? Yeah, there's different things at every track. Obviously, I think Laguna. If I had a choice of like a testing track, it would probably be Laguna, just because it has so many different things. You're wheeling out of the last corner because it's so tight. Then you've got rainy curve or something like that where it's very much more flowing um and it's that's the thing i didn't i personally haven't seen this screen or looked at it that much so i think that's really interesting just how how that is um because you can look at the squiggly lines but i haven't seen this before and it's really quite interesting and i'll look at it for sure one of the things that uh, some people use this for and we'll and we'll uh We'll talk about it just for a, minute, a second here, but people will use this one or percent. Uh, you know, we talked about it earlier. Uh, another flavor of the same thing was your ECU throttle and the and the average. And they, generally speaking, you can look at that. And if you had a higher average or a higher, you know, um, a histogram rate of of throttle, it's a more comfortable bike. If you're able to get back to full throttle earlier and more often. And it shows into the uh, to the average over the laps or in the histograms. You're you're probably happier with the bike, whether it's you know whether it's the you know the the, the cornering or the wheelie you know, the electronics for you know some of that control track control or wheelie control. Uh, it, it kind of an interesting thing way of looking at it. Make a change, go back in and look at your 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 uh, your, your averages there. Sometimes it's fun to look at. The um, uh, Chloe asked a question. Uh, uh, um, one of our co-hosts that comes here with us and talks about motorcycle data quite a bit. She asked in this particular uh, dialogue box right here, uh, how did that distance come up? You know, how do we do that? And it's, it's selectable, right? You have a reference speed that you can select. And uh, generally speaking, it defers to GPS as the reference speed, but you could, if you wanted to change it to, to your front or rear wheel speed, uh, one of the driven wheel speeds, ECU speed, if, it, if it's in there. But uh, generally speaking, it, uh, it defaults to uh, GPS unless you've changed it. So a pretty, pretty accurate, pretty uh, consistent uh, distance number here in, uh, in the race studio data. And then the last one I thought we would chat about just a little bit before we, uh, we, we maybe will take a couple of other questions and then we will jump into some live data. And uh, uh, you've already mentioned a couple things that I think it might be interesting to, to, to look at. Um, this is a split report and uh, we can take the track, in this case, WeatherTech Speedway, uh, Laguna Seca, and, and break it into segments. You could, they're user definable. I, I just picked, a, 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 I broke the track up into maybe some bigger segments than what the, the Race Studio map may do it, but I, I thought these were just some that we might want to look at. And uh, so you got the start finish line down here and, and, and through turn one and down into, I think they call it turn two down here, but the, um, uh, so you've got these little segments in, in colorized views, and then we can take the program, this split report function, breaks that data up into how much time you spent in each one of those. And it's interesting to look at your data. Uh, again, uh, if you joined us a little bit late, this is freely uh, available, downloadable data that Nolan has made available uh, from a professional motor, uh, um, motorcycle racing uh, Moto America series. The, um, the amount of time you spent there and then the, in each segment, and then it takes the fastest segment and highlights it blue. And one of the interesting things I saw here, and I'd like to just get your feedback on the, the, the bike versus the data and what we're seeing, is, is, is one of the things I like to look at is where do those blues fall? And uh, is it, were they early? Were they spread all over the event, or the session? Were they all towards the end? And, and you can set up your race vehicle, in this case, a bike, to be, you know, maybe it's a qualifying setup where it kind of comes in fast and early. Maybe these were brand new tires when it was, when the tires were really fresh early. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, I, I see some riders that, that just get better as the session goes on, as they get into their groove and the blue laps may come, or the blue segments may come later. In this case, they're all within the first four or five laps. What do you, uh, understanding how your class works and your bike and your tires and you, what do you think happened there that why, why were all your fastest segments early? So the data file that this is from is quite interesting. It was from race two at Laguna this past year. Um, in the beginning of the race, I was having some brake fade issues where the lever would be moving. So the first <laughs> number of laps, it was basically waiting for that to bed in. Um, generally, I always go faster at the end of races. Yeah. So 
there was a big gap between me and the person in front of me. So once the lever got to the right point, it was where I wanted it to be. And I wasn't having to mess with the adjuster, or move it or anything. Um, then I put my head down, had some clear track. I closed a four second gap down to the rider in front of me. And then at the end of the race, I had gapped him by, I think, six seconds. Um, and that was after, I think, lap nine or 10. And then there was a seven second gap to that guy in front of me beyond him. And I was still trying to push and close that gap. And I brought it down to, I think, three seconds at the end of the race. But um, yeah, I made a mistake on that last lap. And I remember very distinctly. <laughs> Go ahead uh, and give us a little bit on that. Because I, I mentioned that, you know, the 28s and just steady as a rock here, right? Uh, 28s, uh, think about a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second. It's a blink of an eye, right? And uh, this is a long track, a minute and a half around. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're 1.1 off on the end. What was the... Uh, what happened on that lap uh, from, from your memory? So if you look in sector three, um, specifically on that lap, I ran wide through, I don't, it's turn six, but on the exit of turn six, there's rumble strip and then there's a little green paint line on the outside of that. And oh. I hit the bump and I don't remember exactly what it was, but something happened in the middle of that corner. So then I ran wide and I'm on the gas and I had to roll out of it a bit because I ran off the edge of the curbing and was onto the green paint going oh, up. The, boy. Uh, oh boy. Up the back yeah. side of the corkscrew. So, the um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I had a son that raced, and this was a track that we have gone to. I'm, we're on the West Coast, so we, we get there. Uh, yeah, turn six. Greg mentions that turn six will bite you, and uh, that was that is the corner that uh, that uh, he always came back and would be like, Oh, that, yeah, that one. You're going up here at a pretty good clip, and then you've got this what looks like a 90, but it's a it's a, it's a big wide track. And, and it dips down and, and, yeah. and you roll through. And so you're being compressed. So you can roll, you can carry so much more speed through there, but then there's a good size curb on the inside and, uh, and it's painted. And then there's a bigger curb yet on the inside of that, that I'm sure you stay away from in the bike, but the, uh, the, uh, and then on the way out and there's a big wide open area here, first of paint and then uh, of gravel and grass, right. And then tires. And uh, uh, that is, that is the corner to me. You know, every, a lot of people talk about the corkscrew or some of these other ones, the, and they're all, it, the entire track is challenging. Don't get me wrong, but that turn six is the, uh, is the one. And, and it shows in your data, your uh, absolutely shows that. So uh, uh, interesting. And I did have, I did, um, uh, make a few of the laps earlier in this. Uh, I didn't delete them, but I I, I, I turned them off so that, because it, it made this uh, this data look uh, uh, very very clean. The the first couple laps, I thought there was uh, uh, maybe they were uh, they were not run or yellow, but uh, I, I didn't realize why they were as much slower as they were. And then uh, now you mentioned that, so I would have left them on there if I would have known that uh, you, you were struggling with the bike. That would have uh, helped make that even clearer. But, but the other thing about this that I like and uh, uh, is is the, the statistical values down here below. And again, it, it's pointing to how how good you are on the bike is is if you start to look at this, yeah, you know, it just minimum, maximum, and average of that row of of segments is fine. But this standard deviation is something that I look. I just, it's where my eye goes first, right after looking at how the blues lay out, where, you know, where were you fast? Was, was the bike good over the long run? Fast, early, fast, late, that kind of a thing that we already talked about. But then this standard deviation is, is a value that um, I immediately look at that. And if it's a 0, 0.0 something, the rider is very, very consistent. The smaller, the more consistent. The 0, 0.00 being the, the perfect thing that we can never get at, right? But, and then you start to look at it and you, and, and ones are still very, very good. Don't get me wrong. But the large, you, you would scan this and look at the largest one. You had two of them that were 44s, 144s. And then, then there's that one, which is heavily influenced by that one segment that you talked about. But that's that's just another tool of consistency of the rider that uh, that we that we like to look at and 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 again, I, I bring up some of these things just uh, mainly because I want to uh, uh, reiterate that the the data that uh, pardon me that Nolan is uh, is freely distributing is really really good data and it's uh, there's a lot to learn a lot of great data for you to learn about data and great data there for you to learn about motorcycle racing. So um, very, very good stuff there. Anything you see in there, um, uh, Nolan, that you'd like to throw out there as well? Really, that's that's the biggest thing. Um, I didn't realize just quite how consistent that was. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, because that's one of the things that I pride myself on as a racer and as a yeah. rider is it's 
generally it's staying consistent the whole time. Um, as my crew knows, uh, the beginning of races and generally in qualifying are what we're trying to improve the most with me as a person. Um, and that's one of the big things is, like you and I have said before, there's the three different um, aspects of different things to choose. And it's a lot of people get focused on, oh, I need to improve the bike or the car or whatever it was. But a lot of the stuff is just down to the rider. And that's there's a lot of things in which I may do good or I may do bad. And it's seeing how to improve that side of it. Uh, maybe I just did something weird in one corner and that's that's what it was. Not trying to change, oh, I need to run this setup or that setup or whatever. It's going through and seeing, oh, you, Nolan, as a rider, did this through that. And that's seeing that consistency is really cool for me. There's a, I've had the pleasure of looking at a lot of a lot of data files and and some from very very good professional, you know, high end writers or drivers and the, the the and there's always something to learn right no matter what you can get this beautiful data set and the and the the the, the person just won the you know the national event or whatever it happens to be and and you can still go in there and help that driver understand, you know, okay, well, it, it, it was very, very good, but you know, here's your area of, of two or 3% of, of improvement area. It's not the, the eight or 10 or percent or, or the 25%. It might be for me, but, but it's uh, always area for improvement and, and good writers, good drivers always are, are, are looking for that, that, uh, that last edge. One last thing on the, the split report, I, th it doesn't always happen. In fact, it's rare, but uh, it happens occasionally. And on, your, on this data file, it happened. We have what we call the best rolling lap. And, uh, and in your case, the, on lap eight, uh, aim number eight, probably was lap you know, uh, five or six of the, of the actual event. But the, um, uh, your best rolling lap, in other words, the, the fastest time you went from the uh, any one spot on the track of the segment breaks that I that I created was from the start finish line back to the start finish line. Often this yellow line will start, you know, like you know, entering the corkscrew and back to that spot or something, right? But uh, you stitched together your best lap actually happened to be from start finish to start finish, which is uh, great for the timesheets. But uh, often we'll uh, we'll see it from a different spot, so that's uh, good for good for you on that as well. Uh, if you're working on trying to make your qualifying better, being able to do that is a uh, is very good. Maybe it's something you've been working on. Very good. The, um, uh, the last thing I'd like to do, we've only got uh, just a few minutes left, but I'd like to jump out to, to some live data. And uh, again, this is, the, this, this is the, the data file that uh, we've been looking at all along, uh, freely available to you. Uh, click on the link in the, in the chat box there, or if you're watching this later in, uh, uh, in, on YouTube, it's down there in the description box. Uh, I think you have two different data file sets that you, that you have zipped up and sent out, right? 20, 2020 and 2021, if I, if, if, if I remember right. Uh, we'll make sure we have those links in there. If not, visit uh, Nolan at his website, nolanlemkinracing.com, and the, the links are there as well. So uh, here's a couple of laps. I mentioned uh, lap seven. We just, just picked one here. Uh, and this is the one I had in the picture, just to, to get an idea. One of the ones we talked about was, was this one right here, right? Uh, we, we, we mentioned looking at the time compare bar, and if there's ever these big uh, differences, either way, up or down, and, and in this case, it's, you, you, you had this big area where the, where the blue line was faster than the red line. The red line's across the bottom. I know you can barely see it, but uh, since the lap was faster all the way along on the red lap, it's, it, it's flat across the bottom. But you, uh, you made up some time on the blue one right here, and then uh, coming down into this very, very tight left-hander, decreasing radius uh, downhill, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a fun corner. And then all of a sudden you lost more than what you had gained. And if we zoom in a little bit on this particular one, and we bring this over where we can see it, let's study it a little bit and, and see what you think. You know, you, uh, here, here you are on the red lap, a little bit faster, early on in the braking zone, uh, put the brakes on later on the uh, uh, on the red lap. Your speed trace is showing that. All the auto blipping stuff is happening here, right? Uh, you're not. Uh, I think if we had hand throttle, we would see that uh, uh, your hand's not doing that, but that's the the ECU. And then uh, you tried to roll through. Uh, the uh, it went in a little bit deeper, and you and you came out right. And the and and yet the blue one was a little bit slower on the way out. And uh, the, the, uh, but you tried here, right here, right here, you, 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 I don't know if you released on the brakes, you know, we could, uh, we could bring up the brake pressure a little bit. Do, 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 where did that go? Yep. Was it, uh, 
there it is. Yeah, you you, you, you you were a little bit faster and you used a lot of front brake and then you started to roll off it and, uh, and a little bit of speed there and that hurt you uh, here. And the other part was, okay, well, where did you go, right? I always, uh, the, the, the data traces are all good, but then, you know, th this GPS is so powerful and understanding how you went a little bit wide on the, uh, on the blue right here. And then, uh, and then had to, you, you tightened it up coming off. And that really allowed the, the red lap to, to be a little bit quicker uh, on the way out. You were able to free it up, get it stood up and get it to get it, get it going kind of interesting. The, um, um, so that's one of the things you talked about. And then this whole entire section, let me zoom back out. This section here, look how it started off at being a 1500s behind the red lap. And then by the time you got over here for breaking for the for the corkscrew, you had made up almost all of that, this nice gentle trend downhill on the blue, which meant you were pretty good through there. And I, I and I think that's, uh, uh, you know, what I would want to do is, okay, well, let, you know, why did that happen? We we'll probably won't do that here, but, but uh, it, interesting. It certainly, is, it's not more power. I mean, it's the same same bike. It is four, four or five laps later. You just had a good run through that entire section on the blue lap, and then the, uh, you know, I think you talked about it earlier. You know, here we are coming into the into into the braking zone for the for the corkscrew, and uh, it, it lost uh, you know about fifteen hundreds just in that braking zone to yourself. Uh, not uh, not a big number, and again a blink of an eye. But these are the things that you can go in there and and start to take a look at. We were on the throttle later. You were on the brakes a little bit later, but a little bit harder, and uh, and got the thing down, and then even came off the corner, came off the corner pretty well. And then look at the, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is running around another bike or something, because there is a, a little bit of a difference in line. It's kind of interesting, went in and then had to really rotate it around here, which hurt your exit probably speed just a, a little bit. And yeah, you lost a little bit there coming off as well, right, right, in, right in this area. At that point, you were, uh, the blue one was, uh, was, was two miles an hour faster, right, coming off of the court. Uh, all interesting things. Uh, what, uh, what, what do you, when you when you and Freddie are looking at data and doing some different things, are you? Uh, what are the areas that you tend to work on um, as a writer? We you you even mentioned a minute ago the the data analysis triangle. You didn't say the three pieces, but the you mentioned it, and it was your know, vehicle speed. You know, we're trying to make the bike faster. Your know, rider speed. We're trying to make you better. And then the third side, which uh, we haven't looked at too much, although we've talked about it a little bit, is is vehicle um, health. Right, making sure that the bike you know finishes the races and and try to catch a bad alternator or a high water temperature or low oil pressures or whatever it happens to be. Right, we we do those when you're playing um, with with some of your different uh, data um, tasks uh, in between sessions or something. Uh, what areas are you working on as much? You you mentioned that you you do a lot of rider rider performance side. Yeah, generally. Um... What I try and do is whenever it's the first session, the first session on the weekend or if it's after the race, generally I'll tell Freddie, I'll feel like I try and give him a few things. And generally it's something that uh, trends over the entire lap. Like I remember at Laguna, the first thing was I didn't have enough engine braking. So the bike wasn't slowing down as much and I was having to do a lot with the front end and the front brake. So that's what we first went after. And no matter what it is, I try and give a few things here and there and not come back with seven different things and all yeah. we got to change all these um generally there's something thematic between all of the different things and then focus on that because if you fix that issue then something else might happen and at the end of the day everything that we're doing generally is for rider or driver comfort if you feel better and you feel more comfortable the faster you'll go more often than not so that's generally what i'm trying to find um and he'll come through and he'll find different things on oh your brake pressure wasn't a completely smooth thing coming down. Maybe there was a hitch and something happened here. Exactly like that at Laguna, there's <laughs> a bit of a dip on the back side of the corkscrew and the bike would actually um, stop it or end up a little bit going up over that. So maybe that was something, or maybe it wasn't. Yeah. We'll go through and diagnose that. And it's having somebody to really bounce those ideas off of. I'll give him a few things, um, or maybe he sees something already, or maybe somebody else sees something or however it may be. Um, and then try and go from there and diagnose whatever the situation might be. 
Yeah, and the the uh, th this is that the perfect example. You you talk about that there's a track induced issue here, while our eye tells us this brake pressure. Yeah, what, what what you know what is going on there? You know the rest of your brake pressures look you know, very tidy, very nice. This one here, boom. Freddie's knowledge may be that uh, he understands that part of the track. You you certainly could look at this and go, where am I at on the track? Okay, even your first time out, you oh I, yeah, I'm having to do that because of what the track does. What's really cool about the data that you're uh, that you're making available to everybody is uh, they'll be able to look at this. And maybe they're a Northern California amateur racer and they they're trying to figure out you know something about Laguna that they haven't been able to figure out. They can grab your data and uh, yeah I, I, yeah no look at Nolan's doing the the same thing that I feel. Not, okay, not you know we, we that's kind of settled right a little bit. Let's uh, let's not uh, you know worry so much about that or do something on the bike to make it where you don't have to do that right. But it's terrain terrain directed. Uh, we'll start to, to tidy this down. Is there anything else in the data that you might want to uh, to, to chat about before we uh, be, before we start to close this one down? Um, I think we've covered really everything. The big thing that I found at Laguna and all the different tracks is just not over slowing the bike. Um, and that's what I would do initially is I'd hammer the brakes and kill all the speed, but it's really managing that situation. Turn 11 at Laguna is a perfect example for me and just how my riding style has developed and how it's changed. I remember what I was doing there back in 2018 and then now what I'm doing there now or turn 10 or wherever it may be mm -hmm. and just seeing the different stuff. And especially with the AIM software and all the data that we have is you can look back at what I did in years past or what I do now and just see how this stuff changes. And that's, that's really interesting for me as just a person. Um, and that's, that's the big thing is just not over slowing yourself is what I found with my particular writing. What do you see? Uh, Andy has a question in there. That uh, Andy's our, our resident ECU uh, uh, guru. He in, really enjoys that side of it. What uh, ECU is on on this bike? Is it the stock ECU? Is it an aftermarket? Is it reflashed? What are you What are you running in here? On my bike, this bike, it's a YEC ECU, which is a Yamaha kit software. So it replaces the stock wiring harness, um, okay. and you can do different things yourself. That's what we run. So it's perfect. Perfect. The uh, let's jump back to the presentation here and um, and, and um, kind of tidy this one up a little bit. Um, we're going to put this one up just like we always do. As soon as we finish uh, finish here, I will I will um, put the video together and get it up on YouTube. Uh, uh, if if this is one of the first ones you're watching, make sure that you check out the YouTube page. We've got 192 videos up there now where we're, we talk about all of these live webinars we've been doing, plus a ton of other uh, uh, videos where we talk about specific functionality of the software and, and different things. So everybody go take a look and, uh, uh, and, and let me know if there's something that, uh, that we haven't covered that you might want to see and, uh, and we'll go ahead and work on it. But there's just a ton of information there for everybody. We're a customer support company that happens to sell electronics and we're, we're all over as best we can be. We've got uh, some of these sprinter vans that uh, you'll see at racetracks all over. Make sure you look for us. Uh, and, uh, if not, we may have somebody there that's wandering around and uh, helping people out of a backpack and, and doing the best we can. And but, you, but we can only hit so many tracks. There's, uh, there's races all over the country every weekend that uh, way more than what we can handle uh, personally, obviously. So uh, we, we put, uh, you know, we have an 800 tech, tech line that's uh, available for you to call. Make sure you give us a buzz. If you have any questions about the software, the hardware, you know, configurations, anything you need, give us a holler. We're here to, to make sure that you get the best bang for your buck on, on, your, on your data equipment. So the, um, the next, next week, we're gonna, uh, been looking forward to this one. We're going to take a, a small swing at it to begin with, but um, it's one I've been working on uh, and, and wrapping into even a bigger bigger one, but GPS versus wheel speeds. And uh, it, it's something that uh, uh, the bigger picture view of it, uh, what, where is one strong, where's the other stronger? We're gonna look at it in a, in a, in a bit of a focused way, but we're gonna hit on some of those topics. Uh, and we're gonna talk about GPS speeds versus wheel speeds from a dirt oval cart view, where we're, we'll study some clutch stuff where we're looking at axle speed versus GPS and then corner speeds and, and different ways of using these two values that uh, a lot of people just get, they get their GPS sensor on, you know, that comes with their, with their data logger and they, and they just use that. And I'm telling you, it's, it's very, uh, our, our GPS sensors are now are so good, but there is some areas where maybe uh, a, a wheel speed can be of value. And we wanted to just chat with that and uh, 
been a, a number of questions that I've been getting lately on uh, cart racers that are looking at GPS speed versus axle speed on sprint cart, you know, pavement road racing type carts. Uh, so I wanted to do a series of, uh, of someone, we're going to start with the dirt cart oval and, and, and look at data from both and what kind of value can that be for, uh, for dirt cart oval guys, but uh, the, it'll, it will cross over to, to everybody. So uh, join us next week, David Smith, he's been a co-host with us before. He's going to come in and uh, we're going to bring some data that, uh, that he is working with and, uh, and take a look at it and study that, uh, that specific subject. So that'll be fun. The, um, contact information for Nolan. If, uh, if, if what you've, uh, some of the stuff you've heard today, or you want to get some of the data, you know, there's a, some contact information down here, nolanlampkinracing.com. Uh, and Nolan's uh, email address is oddly nolan at nolanlampkinracing.com. Uh, uh, nolan is a great source and uh, you can see that he's an enthusiastic young motorcycle racer that uh, is, is out is out there trying to uh, trying to get better and doing everything that he's doing, but also help help other people. And I and I for one really appreciate that. And the and the data that he's giving away is is very valuable for for lots of uh, lots of motorcycle road racers or people that are just getting into data that uh, are just trying to learn. There's some real life data that you can grab and uh, and 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 take a look at. So. Thanks a lot, Nolan. I really appreciate you coming on with us and joining us. Maybe we'll have you on again in, in the future. Is there, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add as we kind of close this one up? I just want to th say thank you for having me on. Um, I love doing this and just trying to share more information out there. That's exactly what I want to do. And thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you again for, uh, for, for sharing this and sharing all of the rest of the information. I, motorsports is a hard, uh, hard world and it's a, it's a, it's a slog to learn and get good experience and, and you're, and you're helping many in, uh, in, in several different ways, including this important uh, area of giving away this data. So thanks a lot to you for that. Thanks everybody for joining us. I appreciate it. Hope everybody got good value out of this. Uh, I, I know I did. I enjoyed it very much. So thanks everybody. Let's, let's close this one up for the day and we'll see you all back here next Tuesday. Hey, yes. Thank you.